Good evening, viewers. Thank you for joining us. I'm George the Antique Nomad, at the Antique Nomad on Facebook, Periscope, Instagram, and Twitter. And it's nice to have you with us. We did a big shopping trip yesterday, antique and vintage shopping in Kentucky and Indiana. And a couple of you asked, uh, what did we find? And we thought we'd do a haul video tonight and show you, because we really did find a bunch of cool stuff. <clears throat> Let's uh, start with some of the things we found. We went to a big estate sale outside of Evansville, Indiana in a town called Darmstadt. And the, uh, we would have loved to have filmed it, but the reception wasn't good. So we'll show you some of what we got there. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite haul, uh, things from that uh, particular haul is this piece. I always look for modernism when I'm in parts of the country where they had it, but they're not into it now. And um, hi, JDC, nice to have you joining us. Um, this particular piece is Royal Hager, and it uh, would say that on the bottom ordinarily, but this has the orange peel glaze, and I think you can probably see that here. Hey, Ropom, nice to have you with us. Uh, hey, KMT, nice to have you back too. Um, this ordinarily would say Royal Hager on the bottom, but uh, the orange peel glaze, as they call this, was so thick and heavy that uh, sometimes obscures the mark. Uh, but these were done by Hager in Illinois in the 1960s. Hager was always kind of ahead of its time and uh, very modernist for uh, style, especially considering they're from a little town in the middle of farm country. So um, that's a neat piece from the 60s. I think we paid about $20 for it. It should be worth a little more than twice that. So we'll take that out west with us, I believe, or down to Florida where we sell more modernism. Um, also made in the same era and the same part of the country were these. There's a pair of them. These are Morgantown glass. And um, these are, and thank you for the super heart very much. Uh, we appreciate that. It helps us keep going with all this for you. Um, these are not marked, but they are Morgantown from West Virginia, and these are a pair of candlestick holders. These are the smoky gray that they developed first for Russell Wright. They did all of the glassware to go around, along with the Russell Wright dishes in the 1950s. And so this is a uh, really neat uh, 60s futuristic looking pair of candlesticks. People sometimes use them as bud bases as well. Um, another thing from that era and that same part of the country is this wall pocket. Uh, this is a double wall pocket, and it's what they call weeping gold. This is actually 22 karat gold paint, uh, so it's like gold leaf. There is real gold in it. People get really excited when they see that because it says, uh, Hi Paula, nice to have you back. Um, people uh, get really excited about uh, the fact that they have gold in them, uh, especially when it says it on the back. This one just says Made in USA. It would have been a small Ohio pottery company. Uh, but the weeping gold, as cool as it looks, does not come off as gold uh, when you try to remove it. It's such a thin layer that it just burns up if you try to get it out. So it doesn't have the value of solid gold, but it has the cool look from the 60s. And you can get neat pieces like this in the $25 to $45 range. King Savage, hey, good to have you with us. It's nice to have new people joining us. Um, this piece here, of course, I do shows and sales in Florida. I, I do shows all over the country. I shop all over the country. I conduct estate sales. I think I've done sales in 10 different states. I conduct appraisals, so I get all over the place. And in the wintertime, I go to Florida and sell in shops and shows down there. Uh, this particular piece would have been a tourist piece from about 1960 uh, with the shell and the, uh, the shells uh, put into the uh, concrete or plaster. And these were sold by the roadsides before the interstates. And people uh, really love collecting them now. They were kind of flimsy when they were new. Not everything old was well made. So a lot of these are broken and gone. So they're pretty collectible, probably worth about $25 to $30 down there. Also popular in Florida. Yes, we were busy. <laughs> yes, we were, Paula. We certainly were. Uh, sorry why I'm joined. Well, it's nice to have more people joining us. And uh, please do follow us. Um, uh, if you uh, follow us on Twitter, you'll know about all our stuff. We're going to try to start doing some YouTube as well. Um, anyway, this little piece is a Lucite purse from the 1950s, and it's all rhinestone studded. And what's great about this one is it is really clean inside, and it has a label, which you may not be able to see from there. I don't know quite how this camera focuses. I'll hold it out. Uh, but the label actually tells us that it's made in the USA. 
Hey, Richard in Florida joined. Nice to see you, Richard. This is definitely a kind of piece we see down in Florida and that sells in Florida. In fact, the first Lucite purses came out of Miami in the 19, late 40s, I believe. And uh, they're very popular down there. This one is Eileen of USA, and it says uh, London, New York, and Paris. Uh, so this was an American-made piece from the 50s. Uh, I got a nice deal on this because it was in a place that nobody dresses up. Uh, out in the farm country of Kentucky, so I paid 35 for this. They usually sell for 75 to 95. Um, also boudoir oriented, we're going to keep going on that theme. My next show is out west and I take a lot of boudoir items. I found that these early 70s uh, jewelry trees are really popular now. They were just again a little cheap uh, tourist memento or something you got at a gift store. Uh, this one's got a bunch of ear posts in it and it came complete. I think I paid six dollars for it. Um, I usually get 15 to 20 for these. They're very popular now because it's a good way to sort your jewelry where you can just take it off and use it instead of having to dig through a box or match pairs. Uh, these, you'll see a lot of them with these day glow colors from the late 60s and early 70s because women started getting their ears pierced in that period of time. Uh, now most people have pierced ears and they don't think anything about it, but the Victorians did it and then it became considered unhygienic and unladylike and all sorts of things and so people went to clip earrings and those horrible screwbacks that were so painful. And then by the 70s they said, you know what, piercing is just really convenient and now everybody pierces everything. So times change. Um, this particular piece here, uh, Google user one, nice to have you with us. Glad to have you folks joining us on a Sunday evening. Uh, we're showing some of the vintage items we got in our uh, show uh, in our uh, shopping yesterday in Kentucky and Indiana. There's a couple of videos up uh, that you can uh, replay view of that uh, experience because we went to some pretty neat places. This is a head base. This one is Napco wear. Napco was national pottery company. They were based in Cleveland, but they actually had all the stuff made in Japan. Um, so this head base is Japanese made from about 1960. Now when these were first made, they were just little gift items that came from the florist. So people got a bouquet of flowers in them, said that's cute, and threw them away at the end. And so a lot of these ended up in landfills, so now the ones that are left are very collectible. And this one's cute because she's got the rhinestones in the flower. If they have jewelry, if they have eyelashes applied, uh, the more detail like that, the better they do. Um, also, uh, sort of a boudoir item. This is just about the last rotary phone ever made. This was about the time that the phone company relented and said, okay, you don't have to rent the phone from us anymore, you can buy your own. And so companies in the late 70s and early 80s started making these, and it's right before the dial phone really went out of style. Um, this one will plug into a modern jack and be usable, uh, even though it is about 40 years old. And uh, that was a good find. I think they only charged us $8 at the estate sale for it, which is a screaming deal. A lot of people are getting landlines again, even young people who've never had them because it's a cheaper deal if you bundle. So now people are looking for a cool phone to have around because they're like, hey, I've got a landline, I might as well use it. Uh, another boudoir item, again, same era, Lucite, acrylic, 60s. The rose in here, uh, Pony Norman joined. Nice to have you with us. Um, we've got the little rose in the bottom. Uh, this particular piece comes out, it's the atomizer, so then you spray the perfume. There's two types of perfume bottles, commercial, which are like the ones done from the factory with the perfume in it, and then aftermarket like this. And uh, they're both very collectible. Uh, another thing, since we're on the realm of uh, boudoir items, I didn't find much in jewelry. I know Paula was telling us yesterday her folks worked at Coro. I was hoping to find some things like that, but I did find this. This was actually made as a belt, uh, but this came from the Black Hills of South Dakota, and um, even though it looks like something you'd get from India, I actually believe it was Native American made. It's from the early 70s. It's got lots of nice polished agates, and it was made to be a belt, but I think it lays right that uh, someone who likes big jewelry will actually turn it into a necklace. So we're going to take that out to Washington because we have a lot of jewelry buyers at the uh, next show we're doing. Um, another cute uh, boudoir thing, and then we're going to get into some other styles, but I got this little motto piece. Uh, mottos were really popular about 19... 
1930 to 1950. They were gift wear uh, during the Depression, they were to give you a boost. Then during the war, they were to give you a boost. And they generally are something very sweet. This one's uh, talking about somebody cares, you're in somebody's thoughts. We care for you when we're away, we care a lot. And I thought that was very sweet. It has milkweed in the back, and I always look for the ones with milkweed because they're a little different than the foil-backed ones, a little harder to find, harder to find in good shape especially, and uh, they're, they're definitely more collectible and interesting to people. And this one should sell for about $25, I imagine. Um, now, because I also sell in Kentucky, I'm all over the place, um, I just sold a whole, uh, pretty much every Kentucky Derby glass I bought. So one of the reasons we went to this estate sale is they advertised that they had a bunch. And they had older ones, and the older ones are kind of expensive. Um, oh, we have another new person, uh, Jens Vrilic. Okay, it's nice to have you with us. Um, anyhow, uh, these are the original Kentucky Derby glasses. What you'll see with them is the last year listed is the year before the glass is from. So this one I'm trying to read is 1955 is the last year listed. So this one is from 1956. Well, they started making the glasses decades ago and you had to go to the park to get them. And of course, even though the Kentucky Derby has been around since 1875, it's the oldest continuous sporting event in the nation. Um, you know, Attendance has ebbed and flowed over the years. Again, the Depression and the war years were kind of tough, and so the glasses from them are really rare and hard to find. Uh, the 50s era, there are a lot of harder ones to find, too. Um, this one is 56. This one here is 1960. What's cool about the ones from this era is you notice that, again, modernism, even though they're showing Churchill Downs and the horses, they do it in a very sort of modern design, and you can kind of see the difference in graphics. In the 50s, you have this modern style of lettering. In the 60s, you get to this where it's almost cartoony. I believe this one is 1963. And so uh, on them, they list all of the winners by year up until that year. Uh, they're starting to get very full, and the graphics are getting smaller and smaller because a lot of horses have won at this point. Um, I got to go to Thurby this year. It was really fun. Got to go with a, a good friend of mine, and we had a really good time. Um, hold up closer to camera, please. Okay, uh, let me see. I'll hold a few things where maybe you can see better that I've been talking about. Here's the Derby glass with the uh, 50s lettering. Here it is again with the 60s style. And so um, since we're on the line of sporting and horsemanship, um, I got a couple of uh, paper items at the estate sale on, uh, in this hand here. This is uh, for Ellis Park, which is in Evansville. It's actually a pretty well-known old racetrack in the, this part of the country. And this is from 1963 season, so you could use this to get in any time during the 63 season. Uh, it hasn't been used. Old tickets that haven't been used are more valuable than the ones that have. The other thing I got, someone apparently went to Chicago to a White Sox game, and this is a rain check. Um, the rain check meaning they went up for a game and it got rained out, and so they got to come back again later. This is for 1966. Um, if it was a famous game like the World Series, they can sell for $75 and $100, and some of the old World Series go for several hundred. Uh, the general ones for regular season, Chicago White Sox are a team people like and know, so, you know, probably 5 to $8 for that. Um, I left the price tags on a few of these things over here because I thought it'd be uh, fun for you to see this particular estate sale company digitized everything. And um, a couple of things I found that are going to go to my next show are the pair of antlers here. They were only $10 and they've been veneered or lacquered or, uh, I'm sorry, varnished or lacquered uh, many years ago. They look like they're probably 60, 70 years old. Racks of antlers and uh, taxidermy in general is very popular now. Uh, people use them for coats, hats, just for decoration. Uh, they're definitely something that sells, so I was excited to find that. Also, I found this really cool steer lamp, and uh, my friend convinced me to buy it because, uh, my cameraman yesterday, because he said, you know what, um, this, uh, shades are easy enough to find, you'll find something for it. Shades cost money, so you always think about that when you buy an old lamp. Can I get a good shade that'll make it look cool for not a ton of money? 
Uh, but this was a great base. It's only $15. My next show is in Packwood, Washington, up in the mountains. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, people who are doing lodge decorating, who live on farms, who live in rural rustic uh, areas, and they look for this kind of decor. So I think that's going to be a good seller. Uh, another uh, Kentucky piece, Wild Turkey. These can sell just about anywhere. These, be, uh, these pictures like this were done in the late 60s and early 70s as advertising for the different uh, types of booze. And so, um, and uh, oh, somebody mentioned Henderson, Kentucky is where Ellis Park is. And I forget about that. The river used to be between the park and Indiana and the river changed course or something. And so I always forget which side of the line I'm on when I go out there. Um, Anyhow, so we, uh, we have some uh, fun stuff to take out west, some fun stuff to take to Florida. And then I always like to look for some guy stuff because I do shows. And it's really nice if a couple come into a booth, if they both have something to interest them and look at. So I look for things that uh, I think guys would be interested in. And I did find a couple. Uh, interestingly, this is also very modernist in style from the 60s. And the crazy thing about this is this modernist piece actually is dated 1964 and it is in inert practice grenade. Uh, this would have actually been Flippy Toes. Hey, nice to have you with us. That's a great name. Um, thanks for joining us. We're showing off some of the things that we found in our uh, halls. We did two um, uh, videos yesterday from antique malls, one in Indiana and one in Kentucky. And today we're showing some of the things that we found that we're gonna sell somewhere else. Um, Anyway, this particular piece would have been uh, right at the beginning of training for the Vietnam War. So, you know, that's 50 years ago now. It's hard to believe that all of that trauma took place that long ago. But um, uh, old things from war era, munitions, old bombs, anything shaped like that, uh, definitely something that are interesting looking. People don't expect you to have in a house and they're a real attention getter. And so people do enjoy looking for those sorts of things. Um, Another thing uh, that I found, which I really like because I like to wear, I don't like to wear hats myself, but I like wearing them on TV and Periscope and at shows. And I got this, which I think if I bend down, you can see is a police auxiliary helmet from about, uh, again, the 1950s. And it is uh, very much uh, in keeping with the uh, style of the era. And people like this sort of thing because again, um, if you're a policeman or if you're into um, this sort of decor or even if you just want a hard hat to wear around the house that looks kind of cool instead of some yellow plastic thing that you got at Walmart, well, there you go. Um, and then the last thing I want to show you is kind of a surprise to me. Um, this was in a box and it's an odd looking thing. Uh, in fact, let me switch this around so I can hold it where you can see it better. So this particular thing, it says, uh, do not expose lamp to eyes. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of scary. What is this thing? I've never seen one before. Um, so I took it out of the box and it had its manual. And it says it is an infrared black light. And black lights are something that we have a lot of fun with in the antique business. We use them to detect damage. Uh, we use them to tell whether uh, uranium salt has been used in something like the Vaseline glass that glows a yellow green color. Uh, but we also, uh, they are also used for various things, uh, especially having to do with um, skin problems. So this one was actually a diagnosis machine and it's supposedly going to help you with all sorts of things. Um, all sorts of uh, diagnosis, but also it's supposed to help you with uh, vascular disease. It's supposed to help you with, um, oh, um, all sorts of terrible things. The more I open that book, the less I want to talk about. Uh, but the thing that was crazy about this was that I plugged it in and it shocked me and uh, just a little, but I got a zap and I kind of freaked out and I took it up to the counter and said, hey, you know what? I don't think you should have this out because it electrocuted me a little bit and they said oh well you know what if you use that plug in the garage we noticed that the refrigerator it seems like it's kind of you touch it and it has a shock too and I realized that their outlet was the problem but they were so afraid of it after I told them the truth that they said why don't you just take it and so we're gonna plug it in now and we're gonna find out does it work and will it electrocute me so here we go folks this could be a more exciting end of the video than I was expecting 
Um, here we go, and okay, moment of truth, here's on. Okay, that's when it shocked me before and it didn't do it this time, so that's great, and I see that it is turning a violet blue ray. I think it's the coil itself you're not supposed to look in. I assume I'm not hurting anybody's eyes by showing you this. Uh, but anyhow, it does work. So this is going to be a really fun thing to take around and use to determine all sorts of crazy things. Um, one thing I loved doing when I was running an antique mall is we would turn the lights off at night when it was uh, dark early outside. And we'd go through with a black light and just see all the things that glowed in the dark. And it's amazing how many things do. Uh, so I think we'll have some fun with that for sure. Uh, anyhow, as far as fun goes, this has been a lot of fun for me. Thank you for joining us. And again, I am at The Antique Nomad on Facebook, Periscope, Twitter, and Instagram. And we would love to have you join us again. Uh, please watch our replays and share with your friends, and we'll see you next time.